Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Art of the News, a comics journalism exhibition catalog. I'm Cyrus Lyde, and I'm joined today by my lovely co-host, Audra McNamee. Howdy. Um, we're incredibly grateful to have our guest, comics journalist legend Joe Sacco here with us today. How are you doing, Joe? I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm bad. I hope you guys are doing okay. Love the fact that the heat is leveling off. Yeah, I had enough of that myself. <laughs> well, thanks for being here, Joe. And so, as you know, in the world of comic journalism, uh, your reputation kind of precedes you. So I was wondering what your thoughts are uh, on your figure within the community and how do you feel or view yourself knowing that a lot of this world thinks of you as a founder really boy I mean I try not to think about that sort of thing too much um, as a founder you know I was I'm doing what I'm doing but of course there are antecedents to what I've I've been doing uh, I don't think I'm the first to have uh, put journalism and comics together uh, it was happening with the uh, Illustrated London News. Harper's Magazine used to send out illustrators anyway um, during the Civil War. So there are antecedents. Um, I didn't know much about that sort of thing at, when I started. I wasn't thinking very theoretically about what I was doing when I started. I just had to, I had a journalism degree. I wanted to be a journalist. That didn't really work out. So I fell back on comics and was doing sort of autobiographical comics. And eventually, you know, because I'm, I'm pretty political, I wanted to go see what was going on in the Middle East for various reasons. And so the two things, journalism and comics, sort of came together and began twining around each other. But before my trip out, I wasn't really sure of what I was doing um, or even what my methods were going to be. I couldn't really explain it to myself. It's something that developed very organically. Um, so, you know, what that means as far as like my standing in comics history, I do hope they put me on a pedestal one day. I'd like a statue that no one tears down one day. That's what I want. Um, kind of following off of that, it's been alleged in at least one location I saw that you are the person who coined the term comics journalism. Is that the case? Well, that's an expression I started to use. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say guilty because I don't know. I don't know anyone else who came up with it before that, but others have pointed out that it's a bit misleading in, in, in some respects, because when you think of comics, comics journalism, you, maybe you think it's journalism about comics. Um, I liked using the word comics as opposed to graphic novel journalism because I've always liked the expression comics. But yeah, I'll take credit. I'll take credit. Put me on a stamp. I'm ready for all credit. <laughs> so when you hear the word journalism, how do you understand it? And really, what is comics journalism to you? I mean, journalism at, at its heart is... And I think of it. I think of it in terms of going out and reporting, because I, I sort of, I've learned to separate journalism from reporting. And there's a lot of journalism that goes on that isn't really reporting. It's just people pontificating, and they, it's called journalism. I mean, because they're on a, a news channel or they have a YouTube channel or whatever it is. But to me, it's reporting is what's really important, and and that basically means going out and finding out what's going on. I mean, it it's actually quite a simple concept, trying to be quite honest about what you see, understanding where you're coming from and how that might cloud what you're looking at, and putting it all together with the, what you are trying to assess really is the truth. So putting it all together to, to get as close to something that you could call the truth as possible. You know, I, I also separate it from uh, what I studied which at the University of Oregon, which was objective style reporting um which and and i don't really believe there's a such a thing as objectivity in in most reporting so um i would rather sort of know what my background is what prejudices i'm going in in with to a story and um make those sort of clear to a reader 
So there's a lot of things that are involved in journalism. It's not just, oh, I'm giving both sides of the story or some simple formulation that you're often taught. It's, you know, clawing your way to the truth, basically. And comics journalism, I mean, that's just adding a, a visual component, which is also very important because there's a lot that can be told visually that is difficult to, to get at with prose. I mean, photographers can do a great job of that. I mean, photojournalism is really premised on the idea that one photograph is going to sum up, you know, something entire with one image, whereas comics, multiple images, I, I feel, create an atmosphere or give a reader a sense of what it really feels like to be in a place. So in a, in a way, it's sort of accidental that I've used comics with journalism because when I, when I got a degree, uh, I wanted just to be a straight out news reporter. I never would have thought of getting into bringing comics into it if I had actually made a career at if I had made it, been able to make a living writing, I would have done that. Let's just say that. So I just pulled in what I, other things I knew somehow. So when you're conducting and like creating these works of journalism, um, I feel like you've talked a little bit about what you think the goal of journalism is. But do you, um, for yourself, have like any kind of specific goal for your journalistic pieces? Well, I'm only going to look at issues that really sort of matter to me. The goal is to examine those things that trouble me about the world, to try to go to those places I think are underserved, if you can call it that, journalistically. You know, sometimes I'll see a story where there's hundreds of people with their cameras up, you know, taking pictures. And I think to myself, that's where I don't want to be. I mean, it might be interesting, but I want to go to a place where it's it's not even appropriate to take out a camera. You're not even going to think about it because things are so ordinary. You know, certain things are so ordinary that why even take a picture of it? Um, you know, you can look at my topics and see what's interested me. I've been interested in what ha what's happened to the Palestinians. I've, I was interested in Bosnia. I was interested in poverty in India, um, interested in migrant issues in Europe. Uh, interested in indigenous people and resource extraction and colonialism in Canada. I mean, those are things that have interested me, troubled me, things that I'm teasing over all the time. And a lot of my journeys, I don't sort of think of them so much as, oh, I'm going to tell the reader what's going on. I'm almost going to find out myself what's going on. I'm trying to get to the bottom, actually for my own, from sort of to satisfy myself, like why, why do things happen? And the, the further I go down the journalistic path, it also becomes a matter of psychology, like why do humans do what they do? Not just what happened where and when. So my, I've, I've allowed my journalistic sort of mandate to expand outside of that uh, to some degree. So you've mentioned a lot of the different complex situations and historical contexts uh, that you have reported on. So knowing these things, why use comic journalism to, to write about these pieces? And also, do you think that there, these stories work better in comics journalism? Or do you think that there are some of these stories that lend themselves better to other forms of journalism? Well, like I said earlier, if I had been successful as a writer, if I had found a job that had satisfied that itch, I probably never even would have thought of using comics. Comics was something I was always doing as a kid. Um, so it's, it's sort of hard to say why it was comics journalism, because really if I was a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker, I might have gone to the same places. I just accidentally am in a cartoonist body. So I still have the same interests, but now I'm going to project myself um, into those places with, with sort of the, um, the tools of a cartoonist. And what are those tools that make it work? Well, um, we're visual. You know, we are visual creatures. We are attracted to uh, visual material. And I think people are particularly attracted to drawing. And one thing that drawing can do is it can, it, you can, recreate someone else's experiences if you've done a lot of you know visual research you can you can take a reader back into time quite 
easily and you can draw the present and the past next to each other. Again, you know, the multiplicity of images is the other thing because you don't just give, you know, one drawing of something. You have many, many drawings providing a lot of background information that sort of seeps into the reader's subconsciousness and you have the written element. I mean, what's not to like about that? In a way, it's, it's just got, it's so much going for it. The other thing, especially with, with hard material, I think what comics and drawing al allows you to do is to present really difficult material, even, even what you could say you can depict violence in a way that a reader looks at it and knows it's a drawing and it has, a, has an impact, it has a power, but it allows the reader to look at the violence Whereas sometimes I'll see a photograph that's really violent or documentary footage that's really violent, and I, I literally just have to turn away because it's too much for me. It's too much to see a human being suffering and dying in front of your eyes on film. You know, I think that's sort of a normal response, and drawing is sort of a filter that allows us to go into some dark places, and I think that has great uses. So... Just describe, based on the interests that you have laid out here, it sounds like you have just a lot of things that you're interested in, focused on, and think are worthy of reporting um, in your comics journalism form. So how do you then decide which ones that you're going to like narrow in and like create these enormous works on? Um, and also, what is your normal turnaround time on a project? Oh, well, normal turnaround time is, uh, depends. I mean, uh, for a book length project, it's generally three to almost five, six, seven years, something like that. Um, so it takes time. And that, that actually uh, will, will help answer the first part of your question, which is why do I choose what I choose? Because I know it's going to take a lot of time. I need to choose those subjects that I know I'm really committed to and that will interest me through a very long process. You know, I have to think, okay, I'm making a decision now, and five years from now, I will still be, you know, the, the, the consequences of this, this decision will be that I will be sitting at my drawing table day after day working on this very issue. Am I interested in this enough? Or do I think I can do it well enough that it's worth my time and the reader's time? It's, so every topic I pick has to somehow hit me in the gut or really just, it just has to pull me in. I have to feel compelled to do it. I had, I felt compelled to do a book about the Palestinians. I had to do it. Once I, once it sort of dawned on me that, oh, I could actually, at the time I was living in Berlin, relatively close, I could actually fly to, fly into the Middle East and go see this place. Now, why don't I do that? I mean, once, once you pose that question, why don't you do that? Then you're, you're forever stuck with it. And you bet you have to sort of answer it. And the way I answer to say, well, I will do that. But obviously there are many different topics and this is happening. The older I get, you know, I don't have, I'm not 30 years old and looking ahead to a long career ahead of me. I'm now 60 and looking back. And when I look forward, I don't see, I, I see maybe a decade and a half of intense work. If I'm lucky, maybe two at the outside limit. So you, you, you know, you're, you're narrowing things down and you're saying, well, there's about five or six things I'm very interested in in this world more, but now I have to choose. I mean, the, the choices become more stark the older you get. So I think you're pretty familiar with this next question, but so readers tend to notice that you portray yourself in a more, I guess, classic comical uh, style when you're drawing yourself. How do you think that impacts the way that your books are read with, with your avatar looking slightly different than the rest of the people within your work? Well, it's not something I gave much thought to, but I have heard others say that what the sort of the nondescript nature of the character I draw as myself helps a reader themselves into my shoes you know I'm not so defined 
that the reader can't see himself, themselves, herself in in my position. That said, I mean, it wasn't really well thought out. You know, what I was doing, the truth is, I never studied art, so I was always drawing as a kid, but I drew in, in what's considered the Bigfoot style, you know, that Robert Crumb-esque way where things are a little exaggerated, things are very caricatured. Um, I, you know, I watched spaghetti westerns when I was a kid, so there were these real close-ups and people looked kind of ugly and grotesque. And that sort of grotesque way of drawing things and thinking about things was really in my hand. As I started doing the journalistic work, um, you'll notice a change in my work. Even in the Palestine book, there's a change from page one to the last page. I forced my hand to draw more representationally because the journalistic approach just seemed to call for it. There were many things about the doing journalism that made me sort of pull in some of my tendencies. Um, you know, Palestine, now I look back on it as, as a sort of a charming book in a way. I was so, I was trying to not to keep bored. I was trying to keep engaged when I was drawing. So I would change a lot of angles, do these crazy close-ups and, you know, worm's eye view overhead. It was really fun to draw and that's, that gives it its charm. But over time, for better or for worse, and I'm not even saying it's for better, but but journalistically, I thought that approach needs to be toned down. I need everything to drive the narrative without without sort of thinking in terms of, oh, what's going to interest me on the drawing table today? What's you know, the the big the bigger question was what's going to make the narrative work, which makes for sometimes a more flatter approach one that I'm very aware of and that I kind of have to force myself to do because my natural tendency is to sort of let my freak flag fly, you know, when I'm drawing. And so um, I haven't been able to do that with journalism. I've, I've, I've toned that down, which uh, hasn't been easy. I, I, it's, it's, I won't say it's painful for me to draw representationally, but it's simply not easy. It's difficult. I'm sweating all the time when I'm doing it. I'm not a natural artist. I, I know people like Craig Thompson, others. I, I watch them draw the human body or something that they're looking at. I think they can do that with, with ink on paper right in front of my eyes and not get anything wrong. And I'm sitting there with a pencil drawing, erasing, drawing, erasing, because I just, I kind of don't know how to draw. <laughs> I mean, you know, I bang at it. I bang at it. I think I'm going to ask just a little set of questions kind of about sort of the mechanics of your process and like other things about your process. Um, and maybe I'm going to um, follow up pretty directly on your answer there. Um, because I, at least as a reader, almost perceive um, your comic layout as like this like very playful like very moving thing and it definitely always is driving the story forwards but so often um what you're showing sort of breaks out of the traditional paneled boxes and turns into this i'm i'm thinking actually of the um the nun like beating the young girl um in paying the land just kind of this motion that is this very representational, just many panels of both this girl and this nun, that is this like, I don't want to call it playful, but it is this like very expressive, just sort of like burst of comics. So I guess, what importance do you place on like the stylistic choices of the comics journalism author? And like, how do you sort of weigh this um, art style comics like classical layout like meaning like how do you push the meaning well that's an interesting question i mean um despite what i i said before about trying to draw representationally i mean I, all that is true but I'm, i'll always be glad that i'm not sort of the perfect representational drawer that i come from a cartoony background because some of my panels you you get closer to the truth by being cartoony somehow. You get that more expressive look. A nun beating a child, you can make it 
you can draw it from a, a distance and it's just, you know, what you would imagine if you saw a photograph of the same sort of thing. But if, if I want to sort of get some of the emotional impact, the unfairness of it, um, you, you can do a lot of things. You can, you can have close-ups, you can uh, look at the nun from below to give her more of an authority, you know, her figure more authority. There, there, are, there are things you know how to do that are quite inherent as an artist they don't even need to be taught. I mean, once you sort of understand the basics, you know that you can get more to the essential truth of something by not drawing realistically at all times. There's a scene in one of my books. I don't know if you know it. Um, it's a short story uh, called Shoba. It's in, it's in a collection about some stories from Bosnia. And there's a scene in a club where these guys, I mean, they're listening to Western music in this club in Sarajevo, and you can tell music really matters to them because these are frontline soldiers and their girlfriends, and in a few hours they're going to have to go to the front line. So they are really engaged in the music that's playing. Now, how do I show that? I mean, I'm, I use these cartoony elements of, of guys' head, you know, they're, they're head banging, so I have all these swoosh marks and really try to give it the power that it has to see it that you can't really, you probably can't capture it with a, with a camera. There's no way you can capture certain things with a camera. With cartooning, you can, you can capture the intensity of the moment if you allow yourself to go in that direction. And then of course you pull yourself back and now it's a bit more staid and all that. But I think cartooning, because the, the same hand is drawing the representational as, to, as opposed to the cartoony, cartooning uh, part of it, there's this sort of elastic nature uh, cartooning that you can use to your advantage uh, in journalistic work. Bit long-winded, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, continuing with your art style, um, you, as you've mentioned, it's evolved a lot over the years, and it's kind of evolved into this like very, like you said, representational, but like this kind of like painstakingly cross-hatched um, and like all of these patterns. Um, and it's often, if not like nearly always, black and white. And do you have conscious reasons why like those are the things that you've chosen to develop? You know, sometimes you start you start drawing a certain way at a certain time, and you you never kind of lose it. There've been times I've wanted to simplify my work, and it my hand just goes a different way. I mean, the hand has a there's a muscle memory in the hand that takes over from the brain in your head and at some point you stop arguing with your hand and you just let you, your hand do what the hand wants to do and what my hand wants to do is cross hatching and i've noticed over time it has its advantages because it looks like a lot of work and i don't do anything on a computer it looks like a lot of work but sometimes the drawings themselves can be pretty intense the layouts getting the figures right really going over carefully with ink over over my pencils that's really intense concentrated work the cross hatching on the other hand is almost meditative i need that i need that workspace to sort of decompress from the intense parts if i had a computer program where i could just lay the cross hatching on it would not allow me for that meditative space it takes time but it has its tactile value just the enjoyment of it, just letting yourself go, your mind goes to another place and you're just sort of doing this thing, right? So, um, a lot, you know, I want to, I want to sort of sustain myself at the desk and the way to do that is to sort of listen to your own artistic body and what it wants to do. And I know what would sort of kill me is if, all I was doing was scanning pages, putting stuff in, whatever. And here's the other thing. It's like color. The reason I don't use color is I don't know how to use color. It's not, it's less a choice. When I, when I started doing comics, um, the independent comic scene was mostly black and white. Everyone was working in black and white because it was cheaper to produce that way. A lot of my peers went on to do color and they really knew what they were doing. I, on the other hand, never, I, I still to this day do not know how to use Photoshop. So 
I would, I mean, I don't say that out of any sense of pride. I would like to learn how to use it, but I also don't have the time to learn how to use it. Um, I should, but in the end, what you end up doing is sort of improving on your limitations until it sort of becomes your style in a way. And so that's what I've done. It's like black and white is where I found, I trapped myself and I've just learned as much as possible to use black and white to get the textural elements that you can out of, with the black and white. You can do a lot as far as texture goes with black and white. And now that's all I know how to do. I just, when I, when I draw, I think in terms of black and white. So as you mentioned, you work like entirely in physical mediums, no digital mediums whatsoever. Um, and I would imagine um, that you do like at least some element of editing. So how does that work for you? Like if you need to change text or if you need to change visuals or you need to change multiple pages? Well, if I have to change multiple pages, I just put them aside and say, okay, I got to start again. I mean, if, uh, if I make a mistake, let's say on a face and that happens, I will um, trace the face onto a piece of board. I'll draw the new face. I'll cut it out with an X-Acto blade and I'll paste it over the face. If it's a whole panel, I might cut out that panel and put in a new panel. If it's words, I might use whiteout or I will write out a new word and paste it on. And then what I do is I tell the, and this is probably why I should learn how to use Photoshop. I tell the people who are then going to go through the art and say, there might be a shadow under this paste. So make sure there's no shadow mark or something like that. But it's all done very, very old school. It's all old school, but I, I love that. I love the tactile feeling, you know. And, and also what's, to me, comics are about producing pages. Um, I, try to, I try to work very well. I try to do a good job. And I'm usually satisfied about 90 to 95% with my drawings. But then there's a time I always sort of say, okay, good enough, next page. Good enough, next page. Because you've got to, you know, five years of work, I'm not going to be an absolute perfectionist. And I, I worry that just like digital cameras or or using a computer to correct things, you can really get into this thing of trying to overcorrect and getting things so perfect and you just make yourself <laughs> miserable. And sometimes you change things that are fine. You know, I'd rather limit, I'd rather limit my options for correction. That makes a lot of sense. Um, back, I guess, to the creation of the images. Um, you stated that in the past that you ask a lot of visual questions of the people you're interviewing along with the traditional like journalistic questions and that you take photos um, but do you ever sketch while you're on location very little um you know when i sketched i went on tour with a rock band and i did a comic about being on on this tour and um that you know that really involved uh, sketching. I, in fact, I did not take a camera purposefully, so I would learn how to sketch right there and then. And that was really useful. I mean, the difference between my early sketches and, and after some weeks was kind of phenomenal. And, and part of me wishes I'd gone down that road, because I think it would really have improved my work. But when, I, when I'm in the field, I'm much more inclined to want to just talk to people and get stories. And sketching takes a lot of time. And I know other cartoonists who do journalism, and what they tell me is sometimes I'll be still sketch something as a way of starting a conversation with someone. And I can see how that would work. But because I was trained to be sort of a news reporter, I have no trouble imposing myself on, on, on people and asking, you know, can we talk or can I come back later when we talk? So I'm, I'm talking, I'm, I'm gathering a lot of standard reportorial questions um, other other comics journalists will probably do that different. I mean, that, the great thing is there's no one way of doing any of this. And I just tend to spend a lot of time engaging with people, taking photographs, and then relying on the photographs I've, I've taken uh, to recapture some things. When you're um, out in the field gathering your information, um, in most of your work, you work with like at least one translator or guide or like person in the community um, who like introduces you to people. Um, and so how do you feel like this collaboration impacts your work? Like how does working with that person like 
alter and change what you make? Well, first of all, I should say that in most of the places I've gone without that, it would be almost impossible to do the work. Without a person who knows a community, knows how to navigate that community, even knows the, the mores and values of that community and can sort of say, don't, you know, don't do that, you know. Without that person, it would be impossible. I, I couldn't do my work without some of those people. That's not always the case, but I'd say it's, it's the case 60, 70% of the time. Um, it's really super important for me to get someone who is known within a community or trusted within a community. I seldom have ever worked with a professional fixer. I mean, professional, professional fixers have their value because they usually can, can speak perfectly good English. They are really good at their jobs and all of that. But if, you're, if they're from, let's say, Gaza City, and you want to do your work in Han Yunus, they won't be known in Han Yunus. So you, they, they will introduce you and, and do all the, the fixer kind of work, but it's much better to have someone from Han Yunus who's trusted, who knows really who to go to. And if you're with that person, if you're with that guide from Han Yunus, as I was, He's trusted, he's respected in the community, his family is respected in the community. That's going to open doors to me because he's he's vetting me. He's like automatically vetting me. And the same is true, let's say, the last book I did about indigenous people in Northwest Territories. Now, it wasn't an indigenous person that introduced me to all these people. It was a white person, but she was well-known and and I think – you know, relatively well regarded in those communities. So it was an entree into them. I could not have driven up to one of these communities and just walked out and just sort of said, hey, I'm here to do this. Because what does that mean? Um, It's possible to do your work that way, but you're not, it's going to take a lot longer to build up trust. And it, in some cases, it can be a bit suspicious. You know, Who, who are you? So those people are really important. Now, all that said, you know, you. My, if my emphasis is on a guide who knows a place and is trusted, their English might not be absolutely perfect, but that to me is not as important. So I make sort of certain choices about what I want from someone. Um, there have been times when I've had guides who've said things like, oh, don't tell him this. Like sometimes I'll know, I know enough Arabic because of because I speak Maltese, which is close to Arabic. Um, I'll know enough when someone is saying something like that. Um, you know, don't tell them this sort of stuff. And that's, that's the translator is saying that. So um, people have their agendas. Everyone has their agenda. And even a guide can know that, oh, now you're, he's getting close to something that as a community, we, would, we don't want him to know. And I'll just sort of, I'm not, I'm interested. I'd like to get there if I'm trusted enough. But in the end, I don't need to know who all the fighters are and gorillas and where they live. That's not for me to know. I don't want to know that sort of stuff, if you know what I mean. I want to speak to some people who can tell me things that are interesting, but I don't need to know all the secrets either. So I understand a guide is also from the community, can also protect the community from me in a certain sense too. So it's, it's, there's a a reciprocal relationship, I think, with any good guide. And in the case of, um, uh, in Gaza, for example, I began to use Abed, my, he became my friend. He, he began to sort of, really get into the story and was really helpful in discerning if someone might be not telling the truth or might be exaggerating or whatever, he would start to judge those things. And I would just trust his judgment because he would, he could, he knew the Arabic and I didn't, and he could judge tones of voice or whatever it was. So, you know, you rely on guides for a lot of stuff. Thank God for them. Do you think in any way, possibly you don't, that kind of your early reading of like underground or independent comics um, impacted the message of your books at all? I think the underground comics especially had an enormous impact. I mean, if you look at my work and you look at their work, 
you might not see a lot of um, overlap in terms of content. There's sort of an anti-authoritarian aspect to the underground work, which I share and which comes out in my work. There's also a, a freedom of the way they approached what they were doing. Um, probably now they'll be, they could, younger people would probably judge them for treading on this or treading on that and all that. And, and you know, you, we always judge the past and all that. But for me personally, that was, those were the comics that made me interested in the, the sheer possibility of comics. Otherwise, all I would have seen were like superhero comics or war comics or whatever they were that weren't giving me anything else. I remember reading Bill Griffith's, um, it was called Griffith's Observatory. And it was kind of this, a guy with a telescope just looking at stuff and looking at these outrageous social things and behaviors that were going on. That, and he was calling them out in this kind of very funny way or something called Bicentennial Gross Outs. It was this underground comic, which was had a long story about the war in the Philippines America's war in the Philippines in the in the late 1800s. I knew nothing about it. This is the first time I was learning about it. They would they would get into some po heavy political stuff. I mean, despite all the drug stuff and the sexism and all that sort of stuff, there were there were things about it that that you know were really useful for someone like me just to break help break my mind. It's you know from the mainstream or to understand there are there are possibilities of thinking about things and ways of approaching things. So it had an enormous impact and obviously on my art style. Your early work was like a lot of wartime reporting or like conflict journalism. Um, and it seems like over the years you've um, transitioned to talking about other kinds of conflicts. Um, do you think that you would ever go back to any kind of wartime reporting? And what was it like transitioning out of this kind of war reporting? Um, to your more recent work? Did it feel different? Did anything surprise you? Yeah, I wanted to get away from, um, I want to get away from drawing weaponry and drawing violence. But yeah, you're right. I mean, the topics I chose were heavy and were violence through other means. I mean, poverty, stopping migrants who are absolutely desperate, um, colonialism in Canada, the residential schools in Canada. I was trying to get away from violence and try and, but realizing, you know, you can't get away from forms of violence. You cannot get away from it. The world is full of it. You kind of experience it every day in many different ways. And that was not a shock to me, but it made me realize that some of the books I was doing, even if they weren't drawing war were just as heavy when I was drawing them on the, uh, on the drawing table, you know, when I was actually drawing the stuff, it was not pleasant to draw some of that stuff. Um, I'm not really interested in going back to any sort of a war zone again. Um, that said, my next journalistic book is about a riot that took place in India. Uh, and communal violence. And to be honest, I have not, I, I should have probably started it after I finished the book on the indigenous people in Canada, but I ended up giving myself a, a two year break because I just didn't want to get into it right away. Now I'm kind of ready to sort of approach it. But at that point it was like, you know, I just don't want to get into this sort of topic again, because it's back to physical violence. So that's a great segue into some of the questions I wanted to ask you about. I'm very interested in knowing what you think about the future of per personally with your future and the future of comics journalism in general. So knowing that Paying the Land was released last year in 2020 and that the turnaround time of your pieces uh, does kind of extend into years, what do you think your next projects will be? You told us about this India piece. And can you tell us a little bit about your timeline coming up? Well, the timeline ultimately ends in death. So let's keep that in mind. But between now and then, uh, I would like to do this India book. And I think that'll take, it's not a long book, 
or it shouldn't be a long book. I've already done all the research. I was there. Um, and I've already written the script. It's just now I'm talking to my agent and saying, you know, can you um, get a contract for this book? So I'm, I'm thinking if I really work on it straight, it shouldn't take more than a year and a half to two years, which for me is a very short book. And I think it's a, it's a much tighter book than a lot of my other ones. After that, um, if you want to talk about a journalism book that I kind of want to do, it would be about liberation theology in Latin America. Um, and liberation theology is sort of, uh, I, I mean, in a very simple way, it's, it's mixing some of the gospel with Marxism. And that interests me because, you know, I've met a lot of religious people along the way, a lot of people who, who derive a lot of uh, strength from their faith. And it's impressive to me. Uh, and I'm not a religious person at all, but I know I have a lot of liberal friends who will immediately dismiss any, any thought or theological thought. And I've always, I've been very interested in theology and I'm particularly interested in theology as a source of good in the world, as, a, as opposed to the many, many instances as a source of, you know, ill. I mean, there, I can, we can rattle those off, including in Canada. So um, that's kind of what I like. That's, that's the idea. I mean, the, the, the liberation theology book, li liberation, um, that, that book is speculative. It, it depends on what happens with my health and everything. At the same time, I want to work with um, work on outside projects, like stuff that is more cartoony, isn't strictly journalism, but is very, it's funny, maybe. I want to get back to how I started doing comics because I like to make people laugh. I want to get back to that. It's really important to me personally. I, I So I have outside, I have projects that are ongoing that allow that, but are also very serious all at the same time. And let's just say they're a little more philosophical and get into places where journalism can't go. The more about ideas, the timeline, you know, let's see, I hope, I hope I live till I'm 150 and I'm still drawing at 150, but it's unlikely. So you talked a little bit about wanting to foray into a different space than journalism. Have you ever thought about going into a space outside of comics for some work? Well, I don't really want to do film. I think that's where a lot of cartoonists have these aspirations to end up in film. And I'd say, just go straight to film. We don't need you. <laughs> because ultimately it's like, you know, if that's what you want to do, do that. Because comics to me are a very separate kind of medium. I mean, we, 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 share, we share some of the same terminology. In fact, a lot of our terminology is borrowed from film. But some of the things I'm working on that are not journalism, I'm trying very hard to do things that could not possibly be turned into a film. Like no way can this be made into a film. It can only be done in comics. That's, that's what I'm interested in. I wouldn't mind getting into writing. Like if, if for some reason I couldn't draw anymore, but I could, you know, it's still... Uh, functional in other ways. I wouldn't mind writing, though I do have a fear that my writing um, it wouldn't be as good as my comics would be. I, like, I would never want to be a B-plus writer. You know, I, I, I kind of think of myself as, as quite good at what I do as far as tr comics, but I, I'm not as confident in prose. I mean, I love writing, but I just think there's so many people who can write so incredibly well that I'm not sure I would have anything to offer, maybe. You know, but who's, who knows? Who can say? How do you see the practice of comics journalism changing and hopefully improving in the near future and further beyond into the future? Well, I think there are a lot of people now that are, are doing it. I'm, I'm certainly not the only one. There are many people who um, have really put their shoulder into it. What I like about it is that when I see other people's work, it's quite different from my own. They have a different, a different idea of what should be in comics journalism. They have um, different approaches 
even to the same subject, they would have a different approach. Like Sarah Glidden has talked about being a little more uncomfortable with, with recreating people's experiences through the comics form. And I'm not one to sort of argue with that. I'm sort of, sort of thinking, oh, that's interesting. Well, then you will find a way to tell the stories in a way you feel comfortable as journalism. Frankly, I hope there'll never be any rule set for what we're doing except a, um, a certain integrity that you're, you're trying to get towards a truth or an, an honesty about what you're examining. That to me should be the only rule because a lot of people are doing things in different ways. You know, some people are doing things on the web. Some people are, they're going to a, a, um, a demonstration and right away they're drawing something and posting it right away. I mean, those kind of things are really valuable in their own way. I can't do them. So when I admire people who can do them. It's not the way I do things. I, I want to sort of sit down with things, let, ruminate, even tell stories that are quite old that I still think have a bearing on today or tomorrow. So there are many ways of approaching it. And so I think that the future is sort of good, I think. I, I think you'll see a lot of newspapers and magazines and um, websites or whatever it is uh, looking for that sort of material. It's quite engaging, you know, what, what people can do with it. I'm also, uh, one thing I do hope, though, <clears throat> is that, you know, I think when you're doing reporting, you also have to think in terms of of trying to bring a real A game as far as making something engaging. Simply presenting facts and not sort of pulling the reader in, you can call it journalism, but it's just not really going to, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to interest me necessarily. I always need a human element, a story, a narrative. I mean, this is stuff that I'm not inventing. This is like how it's all it story. Journalism always works the best when it's in, it pulls the reader in. And so any cartoon journalist has to think in those terms also. And I think, Comics allows for that. It just the very simple fact that you're drawing something can make it engaging and, dare I say, entertaining. Do you think that the field of comics journalism has a lot of room for expansion? And how can we grow the audience for comics journalism? Well, you grow the, comp the audience by just producing good work. I mean, this was the big question about... 15, maybe let's say 20, 30 years ago with, with comics in general, there weren't many people doing independent comics. We, we all kind of knew each other. We all knew each other's work and we often, we probably all knew each other personally because we met at these conventions. So at some point, not just in journalism, but at some point, comics created this critical mass and suddenly editors you know, the people who are the tastemakers looked at it and said, oh, this is actually really, really good work, and there's a fair amount of it. And suddenly the perception of comics as not being for kids anymore, you know, came into being, and there was a shift. And the same is probably true for comics journalism, is that if there's enough of it, and I think a lot of, there are a lot of good people working in the field of comics journalism now, when there's enough of it, then it's going, it's more and more, it's going to be taken seriously, I think. The quality of the work and the quantity together. And I think that's, we're on our way to that. And, and also I think um, because of social media, the way people can post things, you know, people, there are people who have bit, way bigger audiences than me that have been working in the field a lot, you know, for a much shorter time, just by the nature of the fact that they're onto the newer technologies. And those are things that, I mean, people like you have to answer more than me. I'm, I'm pretty, look at me, I'm, I'm very old school. I'm glad you can, you know, it's good if you, if you can listen to me and there's something to be taken from me, but you've also got your own thing and, and your own, you know, you have to propel yourselves forward in your own way that I would never think of, in ways I would never think of. What has been the most difficult aspect of your work? You know, it's funny. I'd say um, 
I love the drawing. I mean, sometimes the drawings are difficult when it's about violence and there are some unpleasant drawings you do and you just sort of stick with them and get them done. Because I train to be a journalist and to be a hard news writer, the hardest thing for me is not to be out in the field because I enjoy that so much. I love reporting. I love it. But, you know, reporting is six weeks, two months, two weeks, and then drawing is two years, five years, four years. So I love the drawing, but the hard thing for me is if I was just a prose reporter, I'm, I probably would have covered five times the amount of stories in depth. But that's just, that comes with the territory. And I'm never going to like rush the drawings. You know, I think that helps the work. So, but, but it's always, you know, I'm always a little jealous when I get together with journalists and I hear where they're going, what they're doing, you know, it's fine. It's fine. I'm good. I have, I have one of the best jobs on earth. Is there anything within your published works that you would do differently now if you were given a chance? I'd probably redraw some of the early pages of Palestine because I think they, they rely too much on, and not out of any, any, there was nothing malicious in it, but because all I had done before was caricature and funny, funny stuff. I mean, everyone looked sort of funny. I probably would tone that down to some extent. That's about it. I mean, I forgive myself for that. I've got no problem forgiving myself. There's nothing to apologize for. It's just that, you know, you, your hand drew a certain way and over time you sort of shifted it as, as you saw it was needed. But no, not really. I'm really satisfied with the work I've done. I wish I could have done more of it. Um, but yeah, I'm satisfied. Do you have any advice that you'd give to aspiring comics journalists? You've got to want to do it. Um, it's hard, you know, I mean, I'm not going to pretend it's, it's hard to make a living at comics and doing comics journalism. I think right is difficult to make a living at. Um, as long as you know, you can, you've, you've got it within you to really push yourself and persevere. Then you're on, it, it, there's no guarantee. That's the problem. There's just simply no guarantee in the arts in general, right? There's just no guarantee. But if you're, if you're committed to it and you do good work, then you've got a chance. Let's just say that. And so I hope aspiring artists will, you know, decide, are they ready to sort of really put their back into it? It's, it's a great field and it's important work, I think, really important. Well, that was all very insightful. Unfortunately, it's looking like we are running out of time. Again, this has been an interview for The Art of the News, a comics journalism exhibition catalog. We are very thankful to have had Joe Sacco as a guest for the past hour. Thank you so much, Joe. Do you have any last thoughts for us before we wrap up? No, I really enjoyed the conversation. I mean, my best to you, Cyrus and Audra, and I hope, um, I hope uh, everyone who happens to see this video will get something out of it. All right, well, for my co-host, Audra Matsumi, a comics great Joe Sacco, this is Cyrus Lide. I hope everyone has a great day in the future.